Hello and welcome to another episode of The State of Politics. I'm your host, Declan McConville, and as usual, I'm joined by my co-host, Patrick McGilp. Today, we are delighted to be joined by SNP MSP, Christine Graham. Christine, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. I'm in the middle of writing an article and I've got another meeting. That's why I'm a bit pressed, so I'm sorry. No, not at all. So <laughs> you're again running for Holyrood 2021. Could you yes. give us a bit about your background in politics and again why you're, you're running for parliament? Well, I've been in I've been in the parliament twenty two years. Before that, I was a court lawyer, and before that, I was a secondary teacher. When I tell pupils this, they look at me and wonder how I'm still standing upright. How <laughs> be there? Uh, I I decided, even though I'm in my seventies, I decided I wanted to go back. Uh, because I felt we needed experience. I, I mean, I saw so many of my colleagues who are very experienced, for whom I have a great deal of regard, uh, who were retiring. And I thought, oh, should I retire? And I thought, no, I think we have to keep some experienced people in Parliament to to assist the, the new people that we have coming in for the party, you know, and, and to give a kind of balance. Because 22 years in there, I have learned a tiny wee bit. Uh Chaired, I've chaired four, I'm sorry, I was going to say I've chaired four committees in the Parliament, justice twice, health twice, and I've also chaired the Parliament. So an idea about committees and chairing as well, you know. So a wee bit of experience there, I think. Definitely. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, you joined the party in 1970. Uh, why did you? Why was the SNP the party for you as opposed to say the Labour Party back in the day? Well, it was. A, I have to tell you, it was a tactical. The first time I voted SNP was tactical. I was Labour, and um, my parents were in the SNP, and I thought they were all tartan Tories. Uh, you know, well, by the way, that's the big Ben in here going for good. <laughs> it's a clock. Um, and I was in Galloway, and the Tories were uh, had the seat. And then I said, who's second? They said, oh, the SNP. Oh, God, not the SNP, surely. I said, well, I can't vote Labour. So I voted SNP. And I and I wondered why I had resisted it for so long, because it made sense. Even then, they had social justice issues. Left of centre suited me fine, quite comfy in there. Uh, and so I understand how hard it is for people to cast a vote for a different party for the first time, especially if you're, you know, loyal let's say, a loyal Labour voter or something like that, because you feel a bit of a traitor. But once you've crossed that line and voted for that other party, like us, like the SNP, you usually stick with it. And um, so shortly after that, I joined the party so I could get out of the house and away from two young children and leave them with my husband. So it was for social reasons I actually went to branch meetings. Um, that changed, of course, over time. But there's nothing sort of honourable about how I came into the party. Tactical vote and then social reasons. Of course, then I began to attend conferences and begin to understand, you know, what things were about. Over over time, Christine, how dramatically changing has it been and how, how happy has it been for you to see a party on the fringes be then become party of government in Scotland in 2007? Well, of course, I've seen the ups and downs. I mean, I campaigned in 1979 for the Scottish Assembly. I saw the winter of discontent. Uh, I knew we were going to lose the election in the March. We had looked good in the autumn. We didn't actually lose it, of course. The 40% rule came in. And although we had a majority in favour of the Scottish Assembly, the 40% rule meant even the Dens votes counted for a no. So I've seen the part then in 1980s, we kind of fell apart. We went down to 12% of the vote. Incredible. So I've seen the, va the vacillations of the party over the years. One thing I've learned, um, we're doing really well now, but, you know, political parties, it, the, 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 their um, popularity can slip through their hands like sand. They're not careful. And that's why the most important thing is to stay united. A disunited party is a party that loses votes and loses popular support. So I always believe that in this party, you don't wash your dirty linen in public. Doesn't mean you've got to take everything, but you don't go in public and undermine it. And you certainly don't do it when you're in the run up to an election. You see, you've been in Parliament for 22 years, so that makes you a, a part of the class of 99. That Indeed. Have been 
<laughs> that have been there all the way through. So you've seen the growth of the SNP over 51 years. What's it been like seeing the Scottish Parliament go from a sort of a bit of an idea to an established uh, electoral elected body, which oh, people like me and Declan just take for granted? I, I, and it's wonderful. I mean, I have to remember when I'm speaking to people in their 20s that it's not new to them. It's always been there. I have to keep reminding myself of that because I remember how hard it was to get it. Um, it's a big difference. When I first went in, it was like being, you know, when you first go to school, let's say, sit in the desks all, the, the classroom's all clean and, and there's this clean smell and the desks are shiny and you get, you go with your new pencil case and fresh stuff and all that. That's what it was like when we went in 1999. No, there was like a classroom, but there was... You know, we got lots of mail in and there wasn't there wasn't a lot of emails. It was quite quiet. And I thought, well, this is this is a kind of easy job, what, what, you know. And we were all green. We went on to committees and we had no idea how to be on a committee, most of us. Some had been councillors, they get an idea, one or two had been MPs. Most of us hadn't done it. So it's become much more professional. And 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 now of course we get emails, I get hundreds a week. Um and I have professional staff to help me with it. So it's much more professional across all the parties. Um, and I have to say, when somebody comes in now uh, into the parliament, those that are going to be re-elected or elected for the first time, they'll have to hit the ground running because they're walking in to a place where there'll be people sitting there, know how to do their job, all the skills, in debate, in committee, handling cases, dealing with constituencies. So it's really... It's really quite tough for people coming in. So it's, the, the standard is far, far higher uh, than it was previously, in my view, over the 22 years. We get one or two people who are not up to scratch. I wouldn't name them. But most most MSPs are very competent, and, and, and that goes across the parties. Kristen, you spoke about your involvement earlier on in committees over the years. Um, I'm somebody who is opposed to the House of Lords in Westminster. Yeah. How important do you feel that the committees are to the Scottish Parliament? Would you like to have more MSPs elected to Holyrood so that there's better representation in committees? And in comparison with the Lords, how effective do you think committees are in the, the, the running of the Parliament and how effective in the running of Scotland? Well, first of all, we should have more MSPs. Uh, but that'll happen with independence. I mean, we, we have to have more MSPs because... The workload that they have, some MSPs are on two, three committees. You can't, you can't do justice to two or three committees. So we, we need to have more MSPs so that they've got time. I also would like to see a revising uh, chamber of some kind because the pressure on a committee at, you know, a, as a first level coming in because we're unicameral means that we don't really get the chance for it to be scrutinised post-legislative. Tried to do it, it's not working very well. Certainly not a House of Lords. My goodness, I'm I'm a Republican. I don't want, I don't want royalty, let alone a House of Lords. But um, what I would suggest is that in some way we either have um, by an elected second chamber, by the way, um, of um, you know retired MSPs or even not even it, but, but elected. Don't quite know how you would do it, but to come in and post legislative scrutiny so that when the the acts have gone through that in practice then this other one can review it and see how it's working because we can't get around to that and and um, there just isn't time, there's too much pressure. And I do think that's where there's a gap in, in what we have. I would also like to see people on committees behaving less as if they've been whipped. Um, you know, you're supposed to be non-partisan. Well, that, of course, is rubbish because they all, all the parties act um, pretty well. Uh, the way the party wants them to on committee, with the exception, perhaps, of public petitions, standards, perhaps, and procedures, you know, these ones. But things like the subject committees, I mean, you can guarantee, you know, the SNP will vote together, the Tories will vote together, Labour will vote together, and so on. And very rarely do they break the whip, which I have done. And it's very hard to do, and it's not easy, um, and you get into a lot of trouble, and you shouldn't do it too often. I speak from experience. Uh, but, you know, there isn't that free thinking on the committees. So perhaps we need a, a revising chamber of some kind that's elected, um, a, a rising chamber committee, uh, you know, to look over what's been happening once the legislation's through. 
you're, you're talking about uh, partisanship. It's a very long, a very long answer. I think I got lost in the middle of it. Very <laughs> long question. It's a good <laughs> answer. Not, not a problem. <laughs> Uh, you're talking about partisanship on committees. Obviously, the best yes. example of that was the uh, inquiry into the uh, Scottish government's handling of harassment complaints. Yeah, well, the Tories yeah. were uh, slinging mud at Nicola Sturgeon from basically November until the 22nd of March when the Hamilton report came out. Should never now... have been. Should never have been a committee, an in-house committee. If you've got a political hot potato like that, you put it out of Parliament and should have been an independent. Committee detached from Parliament should have been that from the start. There's no way that was not going to be party political, not in a million years. Yeah, something like James Hamilton's report, then something. In well, the that, that's that was exactly the right way when the first minister referred herself. I mean, nobody they tried, other parties tried to have a go at the Hamilton report. We can't because the man was wholly independent doing it, and that's what should have happened from the beginning with the, the inquiry that was set up in the Parliament because, I mean, it was like um, target shooting, wasn't it? Yeah. And going back to that committee, you're seeing things about David Cameron and Greensill and then Boris Johnson's uh, <laughs> untruthfulness in Parliament. I think six party leaders in the House of Commons uh, have come forward and reported it to the Speaker. Do you think this shows a bit of a hypocrisy from the Tory party when they're sort yeah. of turning a blind eye to Boris Johnson but they're trying to get Nicola Sturgeon to resign? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, hypocrisy is a bit. Sm it's a small word for what they've been doing down there. But you know, this has been the problem for the Scottish Parliament. We have a lobbying register. If I so much as stop by a stall in the garden lobby, let's say supporting breast cancer, and get my picture taken, that's lobbying, and they will send in a note uh, to the Parliament to say that I was lobbied on that date. And I have to say, yes, that's all I did, which I don't mind, but that's lobbying. What we do in the Scottish Parliament, we're under huge scrutiny. It's another rule for them down at Westminster. You know, jobs for the boys, the pals, we lunches here, there and everywhere. You want to speak to the head of the Treasury, certainly. Just get, here's his phone number, you know. And it's just, and, and yet they get away with it. And, and, and because I, I, it's sort of just been accepted that there is sleaze at Westminster, whereas you so much as say, I don't remember being at that stall where they say I had my picture taken, um, and you're brought up for it, you know, because you might have forgotten that you just stopped and went, hello, yeah, do you want your picture taken with this puppy for animal welfare? That's lobbying. So you can see the huge gap between, and I don't mind that. I'm, I don't mind the fact that we get that scrutiny, but I have to say the hypocrisy is breathtaking. Don't you worry, I'm going to use it. If anybody uses it against us in the hustings, I'll be ready to fire pellets right back at them. So, Kristen, you spoke there about the difference between Westminster and Holyrood. It's something we'll, we'll touch on in a bit in terms of, of Scottish independence. But for just now, going back to party politics, the SNP released their manifesto last week. It's very ambitious. There's yes. a lot of policies in it that people would say target young people as a as an older person that's been through uh, the years at Holyrood, what would you say is key in the SNP's manifesto for older people? Well, uh, can I just first of all say about young people? I'm delighted. I, I mean, I'm delighted that we have free tuition at uni university. We're given support. I was the oldest of a family of five in a council house scheme. And my generation, girls used to leave school at 15 if you're working class, you know. You get married at 20. That was your role. My family wasn't like that. I was the first in my street to go to university. First to stay on to be 17. I left at 17. Then a year later, I took a year out. We didn't call it fancy in those days. I just needed money. And then, and, and then I went to university. And what I am today is to do with my education in a state school and then university. And I've been at university since when I did my law degree. So education and supporting children they maybe don't have the kind of parents that I had, not through the fault of the parents, to make the best of themselves, whatever it is, through primary and into secondary, absolutely crucial. So that's the first thing. And remember, every, every many older people are grandparents. So when you ask me about older people, I also think about their grandchildren. But to go to older people now, 
COVID has shown us that leaving the private sector to deal with care homes in the main, and there are good private care homes and not so good, just as there are uh, local authority run. We've taken our eye off, as they say, the ball there. And what we need to do, and I really much support this, is a national care service. I'd like to see us having a national care service on the same footing as our national health service, where the rest of us pay through our taxes so that people who need that support, as they do in the national health service, if they need it in the care in the care sector, either in a care home or care or care at home, they get it because of the taxes we pay. That's a socially just society. So if you take the two ends, it's making sure that children get their potential, uh, you know, and from early on and support the ones that have a hard time, maybe not get the happiest background, right through to the older people at the other end of it, where you can say, you needn't worry if you're broke, you don't have a lot of capital. If you get to the stage where you can't take care of yourself, the Scottish national state, the Scottish state will do it for you instead of worrying themselves, you know, but what's it going to be like for me? Am I going to be in a terrible care home or am I going to just have to stay at home and just cope on my own? That's all wrong. So I very much support the National Care Service. Another uh, policy pledge in the manifesto is uh, to have an independence referendum in the first half of the parliament. Yes. Uh, Mike Russell has laid out in, I think, the national newspaper, the 11 steps, and it's basically put a bill to Parliament. If you don't get a Section 32 order, let the UK government challenge it in court. Yeah, that's my view. I haven't even read the steps, by the way. There's too many steps. How many were there? 11? I think it was 11 he put in the oh paper. Oh, my God. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have three. <laughs> <laughs> you, get, you get the right to have a referendum. You get you either get the Section 13, you don't Section 13, you go to court. That's three steps. You don't need 11. Yeah. What would happen if it went to court and say it's a sort of a, a, a grey area or they potentially lose it? What Do you go ahead with a referendum well, even if it's I don't, illegal? You're asking a, a former solicitor to say that. What you would do, and I'm sure they have done this, is look at take council's opinion on the prospects of success, you know, in a constitutional matter. Now, under the UN, every nation or every race of people who consider themselves a nation have a right to determine their own future. Now, nobody can deny that Scotland's a nation. Yeah, we go back to the 11th century. So we're a nation. And this nation will have decided by a referendum on which on the ticket for several parties will say independence and independence referendum. They have a majority in the Scottish Parliament on proportional representation. How can you say that people haven't spoken? Not first past the post, a proportional representation, and they have an overall majority in the parliament. And, you know, my view of it is this. I, I always say to people that say, you know, you hear the Tories saying, or the Liberal Democrat, the Labour saying, you no, know, we deny them a referendum. What have they got to fear? They're only denying it because they think they'd lose it. And that's even worse. That's saying you're not having it because we're not going to win. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, you say what they should be saying is have your referendum. You've got the majority, have your referendum. But once you've had it, shut up for a bit. But they're not doing that because they think they'll lose. So my argument is the reason they're, do, they're denying it is because they're going to lose it. So I think the arguments in court, the constitutional arguments are quite strong. The political arguments are overwhelming. I think from that point in 2014, there has been material change and it should be up to the people of Scotland to decide on that. And again, in 2021 election, if a majority of independents supporting MSPs, whether that's Greens and SNP or just SNP MSPs are returned, then it should be allowed because it's democratically right to yes. allow another referendum to, to take place. On that, Christine, if Scotland... I don't want to say if Scotland, when Scotland gains its independence, you, you spoke earlier that you're a bit Republican. W would you see Scotland having a vote on the monarchy? Um, I know the party's official that, stance on it is to keep the monarchy, but yes, do you think it should be again be up with the people of Scotland to decide that? That's further down the road. There's no there's no demand for that just now, and that's much further down the road. Um, I mean, the first step to me would be Either you incorporate in a referendum for independence rejoining the EU, you do it in a winner, you say that, or you then have your referendum for independence 
get your independence and then say, now we're independent, I, we, we would wish to rejoin the EU. I would do them together. It would make sense to join them together because asking for independence is also saying we're seeking to be part of the EU again to rejoin. These are more, these are crucial. Um, I think that for the time being, the royal family will probably limit itself even more, uh, you know, restrict itself to the, the cohort that you see in the balcony now, not all 30 of them or many there are. Um, and you can see by actually the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral, and I met him a couple of times, a decent enough man. This isn't personal. You know, as a deputy presiding officer, I walked around Parliament with him. I had a laugh. Um, it's not that. It's to do with the institution of privilege. And the privilege through the all of the aristocracy, through all the lords and all that stuff. Goodness, we've got lords sitting in the House of Lords. Just because their father or mother decades ago happened to marry the right person or kill the right person or something like that. <laughs> Nonsense. So um, so I would say no, that's not a priority. The priority is independence, Europe, and recovery. And I was asked today by a newspaper, uh, what about recovery? I said, to me, independence is recovery. You know, they go together. You get them together and you're able to formulate a, a, a Scotland that has social justice at its heart, doesn't have nuclear weapons, you know, doesn't get into illegal wars, doesn't make arms for other countries to fire at poor swords in the Yemen. You know, you don't have any of that. We're a different kind of nation, a bit like New Zealand, you know, cutting our own path. So I think that's more important than the, than the royal family. You've spoken about how uh, a referendum should take place if the parliament votes for it, uh, and that would be a simple majority of 65 or maybe just a plurality. So obviously you don't think that we need a super majority of any kind for a referendum. Uh, are you disappointed by not only uh, the former First Minister Alex Salmond's actions, but also a sort of careerist move to get back into parliament with the ALBA party? I, I'm not going to go into personalities here because I, I just my problem with ALBA is this. That in if they if they stand in certain areas, take the south of Scotland. I'm not on the list there, but south of Scotland, if they get, and I don't think they're going to get, they need to get six percent at least to take a regional seat. If they get three or four percent, I know who they'll take it from. Us, we will lose an MSP, and the unionists will gain one. That's my problem. My problem is that I don't think they're going to take 6% of the votes in various regions, but they will take votes from the SNP, and we may lose MSPs to the unionists because of it. Because it's all to do with the percentage of the vote. And that's my issue with them. I think it's misguided. Kristen, you, you spoke earlier, you touched on the Duke of Edinburgh being deputy residing officer in the parliament for its last term. Could you talk us through, you're the first person I've had in the podcast to have held that, that role. Could you yeah. tell us about your election to that and what it's involved? Obviously, along with Linda Fabiani and, and Ken McIntosh as presiding officer. Well, it was, I mean, you just put yourself forward and then there's a, a, a ballot. Um, there's no hustings or anything. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get elected. Uh, Linda got elected and I got elected. And... The, I remember at the time, uh, some people thought, oh, two SNP uh, as deputies, you know, that'll be political. In fact, it's nothing of the kind. Um, both of us, when we're in the chair, are very, very independent. In fact, I was harder probably than our cabinet ministers, that I was harder on them than anybody else. I was harder on everybody. You see, I used to be a secondary teacher way back, and none of them knew that. And when they were being, if I'm putting inverted commas, naughty, the sort of school teacher came out and I told them, because from my view, you know, I want that parliament to be respected, not like a playground brawl. So while you can let things get a bit excitable, because that's a passion, passion is allowed, but vulgarity and rudeness is not. Passion is a different thing entirely. So it was really interesting to do it. Um, I enjoyed it. I think I did it quite well. Um, and then I was at uh, bureau meetings to see how the business was done. So that was all interesting. And of course, I was still a constituency MSP. So I was still political. Out of the chair, I was political. I didn't speak very often in debates because I was often part chairing them. But I was able to ask questions and things like that. So I had a bit of, a bit of both worlds, actually, at the time. 
and I, I enjoyed it. And the cheese plant that I've left in my room is so big, whoever has got to start looking after the cheese plant because it's about 20 feet. That's a serious matter. Security staff, I hope, are watching it just now, even as we speak. <laughs> You're talking there about uh, parliamentary procedure and how the chamber operates. Um, yes. In Westminster, you have private members' bills. I believe it's the same in Hollywood. Uh, how, they're not called is... private members' bills. They're just called members' bills. All oh, right, okay. We so, would hate to use Westminster language. In this terrible of me, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how hard is it to get a members' bill? Uh, how often does it happen? And so, uh, what is the process? Because you're the one oh, driving it. Is it your I'm... staff that write it? And... No, 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 no. I've had one already. I got the Control of Dog Scotland Act through, which I inherited from Alec Neil, and I've got a bill ready to go forward, it's again to do with dogs, welfare of dogs, Scotland bill. Couldn't proceed because um, of COVID, we ran out of time, and that really is regulating the purchase of puppies. It was to do with puppy farms, prevent all that. It would be good to have had it now with all these COVID dogs and puppies being bought. It's it, it You have to be very committed. Uh, there's a special unit uh, in the Parliament, um, which is the, and I'm trying to remember its name, uh, it's gone out of my head, but anyway, a special unit in Parliament that deals with members' bills, just like the government has their own departments for bills, non-governmental bills unit. There you go, I should have remembered that. And it takes a long time to get a bill through. I've been working on my bill for two years. But yeah, you, First of all, you, get, you do a consultation, then you get... Um, you ask uh, members for support. If members support your proposal, you then go through and you're able to get it drafted. Then it goes backwards and forwards. Then it goes through the normal stages of one, two and three of a bill. But um, it does take a while. I had another bill, uh, the extension of the Pentland Regional Park, and I only got the support of the Greens. Well, at least I got the support of somebody. <laughs> but <laughs> the SNP did not support my bill. Um, but, you know, so I've had to go at three and one is ready. One is actually printed and could be picked up. But the whole process is on the Parliament's website. And it's good because it means that, unlike Westminster, a lot of members get their own bills through. So it's a very good process. In terms of public petitions, Christine, probably one of your greatest successes has been Borders Railway. Um, how did that come about? How did that move forward through the years of Parliament? Well, it's a bit like how I became a politician. We became a politician through accident. I'll look into that here. That's for the memoirs. But um, <laughs> I was walking in Gala Shields one day and I met somebody and her name was Peter Bieberbach and she was uh, head of the campaign for Borders Rail at the time. And she said, she's, I've got a petition here for, this is in 1999, I've got a petition to reinstate the Borders Railway. I says, where are you taking it? So I'm putting it down to Westminster. I said, don't take it there. We've got a petitions committee. I'm on it. I was on it. Um, I says, bring it to them. I says, so she, so she brought it to that committee, and that was the beginning of one bit of the campaign. Um, I actually persuaded um, the petitions committee to go down to Gala Shields, uh, you know, and hear the public. I have to remember Polly McNeil was laughing. She was on at the time. She says, Have you, is there something in this for you, Christine? I says, Pardon. And then we went to Gala Shields and 250 turned up. But I also set up the cross party group campaign for Borders Rail. Bear in mind, I wasn't the constituency MSP at the time. It was a lovely man called Ian Jenkins who'd come in as a sort of four years retirement thing. You know, the, the Liberal Democrats give him that. And, of course, he was sleepy. So I was all over the place. I was in the paper. It was an easy target. Anyway, that's where it started and pushed forward with it. And, I mean, I'm just thrilled about it. And one day, I'll just tell you this last thing, the railway had been built, but it hadn't been running yet. And I'm sitting in the garden lobby because I chaired the health committee. I see a lot of people going past me. Now, where are you going? They said, we're going down on a bus to Gala Shields, and then we're getting on a, the railway as a test run. I beg your pardon, I said. I'm doing that. So actually, um, I think it was Elaine Murray, who was my Labour deputy, was passing at the time. I went, Elaine, chair the Justice Committee. I'm off to Gala Shields. So I just hijacked onto the bus. <laughs> I went down, and I was on that first test run with the carriages 
up from the line and the rest of them were all you know, paying much attention. I was thrilled, thrilled. But I was disappointed at the same time because when I looked out, I forgot that when you build a railway, you, 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 you destroy the landscape at the side, you know? It was all barren and stones. Oh, this is horrible. But of course, within a year, it was wonderful. And I was also on the first journey uh, down, you know, with the Queen. I wasn't with the Queen. She was with me, but in another carriage. Um, and I sat there on the train. And I'll never forget this. I wore a giant hat, which was silly because nobody knew who I was. It's the si size of a flying saucer. <laughs> I looked out to the right of the window in a place called Stow. And we were 30 minutes late because the Queen's helicopter couldn't take off in the mist or something. Anyway, telling the importance of this because a guy who'd been waiting 30 minutes in that field on his horse. And I know if you've seen the movies, cowboy movies, where the man races his horse at the side of the train, he did the same. He raced the train, he raced the train to the end of the field. And we were all cheering. I'll never forget that. It was wonderful. <laughs> I just and I use it to go down to my office, which is a five minute walk from the station. So I had it built just exactly the way I wanted, <laughs> right to the door of my office, practically. <laughs> uh, just finally, for me, Christine, before you go, um, the manifesto has stuff like no dentistry charges, uh, yes. extension of free school meals to all primary pupils, uh, nationalisation of Scott Rail, bringing it into public hands. You've mentioned obviously the um, national, national care service. Yeah. What would you say is uh, the policy you're most looking forward to uh, bringing into law? National Care Service. I think, I think, had it been at another time, but the fact that one third of the COVID deaths occurred in care homes, and we know all the difficulties there, that the clinicians thought they were doing their best, the care homes thought they were doing their best, the government, you know, when we knew so little about this transmission of this virus, I think we have a duty um, to ensure that uh, the National Care Service is, and I know they've already put money into, you know, scoping this, National Care Service is a priority. Christine, we've saw a different uh, approach um, from Nicola Sturgeon in this campaign of, you know, re-electing her as First Minister for experienced leadership. Do you think that will serve the SNP well in, in this election? Oh, yeah, she's been an absolute star. I mean, I don't know if you know, I usually sit behind her at First Minister's yeah. It's not really my seat. I pinch it. I have to be there very, very early. <laughs> John Swinney says, "Do you come down in your pajamas?" I says, "They're under my trousers." Um, but I see her. I see her from the back, and I can see, you know, how she handles things at close range, and I can see how she reacts to things that are really spiteful that are sometimes said to her, and she rises above it. A huge regard for her. I mean, I, you know, I've had my ups and downs with her over the 22 years. I've had my wee battles about things, which I don't need to go into. They're not relevant now. But over this past year plus, I've got nothing but the highest regard for the way she's handled this and her stamina. Plus the fact she's in three inch high heels. For the love of me, I don't know. I don't know how she walks in them, let alone keeps them on all that time, but she's got them. They're higher than they ever were, by the way. They're enormously high heels. She's on scaffolding. Uh, uh, but she's and she, she's smart, she's elegant, and she is, you know, she handles the questions really, really well. And I have to praise, in fact, the rest of the cabinet, particularly John Sweeney, because John is her lieutenant, and he sits with the same paperwork you know, helping her out. Jean Freeman did the same, you know, Rosanna, they were, they were a great team. That She had that her back the whole time, so no, huge regard for her. You can tell her that, she'll maybe be nice to me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just finally, Christine, the question we can always finish on me, I guess, is what would you like to see in the next five years in Scotland, from the Parliament and from the country, as, oh. we, um, as we bounce back from COVID? Independence. I mean, that's it. I've campaigned now for over fifty years for this. So, and and I'm not just saying it to for the sake of it, but we'll not have a better opportunity, and not just in my lifetime, which you know is. Well, I hope I've got a bit left, but um, I th I think in the next decades we'll not have a better better opportunity than now, and I hope the Scottish people realise that. Um, they've got an excellent first minister. Um. The, the whole issue of Europe is going to come home 
soon. It's been concealed. The problems of trade has all been hidden just now. I know the problems. I was on the Europe Committee. I know the problems that are about trade. All that will come back. And we've got Boris in London. What more could you ask for to say to people, we could do a darn sight better? Well, Christine, it's been a pleasure for you to join us. Hopefully we'll see you back at Holyrood behind the First Minister. After me, we wish you... We wish you all the very best in your re-election. And, it's uh, lovely to meet you both. <laughs> yes. Lovely to meet you too, um, Christine. It's been a pleasure having you on. on. Thank you very much.